article called The Tipping Point in response to the recent transitioning of generals. I'm not sure if many of you have been heard or have been familiar with what has transpired recently. Uh, we lost one of the greatest preachers, I believe, of the 20th century, and that the Reverend Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, uh, who passed away this week. Uh, he was 96 years old and was one of the greatest preachers uh, in the world. He was listed as one of the top uh, 12 preachers in the English-speaking world. Uh, he was on In Time Magazine three times, the first in the 60s and then in the 80s uh, and as of recent. And although he may not be uh, familiar with recent times or recent generations, it is his impact and his influence and his mentorship to Dr. King that enabled him to be who he was. Amen. And so uh, on top of his transition and his passing, uh, we also received news and saw the news of another man uh, from a different community by the name of Dr. Robert Schuler, who for many years had a television program. Many uh, in my generation are not familiar, but had a television program called The Hour of Power. And it is from that framework and that idea that we even see today in our generation, pastors and preachers, and you even see me sometimes wearing blue jeans and, and blazers and all of that. But it was uh, Robert Shuler's ministry that influenced the church into becoming uh, more oriented toward people who don't do church. And it is through his influence that we also receive great people like John Maxwell uh, and others that have made great impact. And then on top of that, from Holy Thursday to Robert Schuler to Good Friday, uh, we heard of also the passing of Bishop William Bonner, another uh, general that was more so into the uh, African American Pentecostal community. And so all three of these individuals <clears throat> transitioned in a span of three days. And so the Lord really began to somewhat deal with me about this, and we put it up and sent it out. And I was uh, amazed, uh, Sister Mercy, by the response over 3,000 people. Uh, viewed the article and, and uh, even a um, family member from the Bonner family reached out to us and uh, I was definitely shocked uh, by the response and I believe today and I want to reiterate something in this I believe that we have really entered a tipping point everybody say a tipping point a tipping point is when uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book many years ago it is when an idea or a particular concept uh, emerges that changes everything and as I shared with you last week as I began this uh, based upon the uh, theme that we use based upon Empire I want to uh, fully cause us to understand I want you to hear me this one I want to really break down and get us to understand this it won't take me long but we must understand when we have embarked upon a moment and and it is very important to understand that the most recent and the most relevant things are the most ancient and so jesus comes and as i dealt with last week he says in john's gospel my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom is not of this world but before we even get to the latter part of this as he's preparing himself for departure and getting ready to hang upon the cross i want to return to some very critical things that we will find in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel is the Gospel, and I want you to just get this down and understand this. Matthew's Gospel is what we would commonly call or know as the Kingdom Gospel, is the Gospel uh, that really gives us the understanding of how the Kingdom of God works. And the reason why is because Matthew specifically takes time to write to the Jews. And the Jews had a framework and an understanding of the Kingdom of Israel. But now Jesus comes with an entirely new understanding that they were called to bring in the kingdom of God. In the Lord's Prayer, or the prayer that the Lord teaches the disciples when he teaches them to pray, uh, he gives them very simple instructions. It says that they are to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice he did not say thy church come, he said thy kingdom come which means that we have been given an instruction to bring the kingdom of God, heaven's reign, heaven's influence, heaven's impact into the earth wherever we shop, eat, work, and live. And so I'm going to really take some time because the Lord's really been dealing with me about this 
and to really return to some of the major foundational things that I did uh, many years ago. Uh, there is nothing more powerful, and I want you to understand this, there is nothing more powerful than an idea. There is nothing more powerful than an idea. There is nothing more powerful than an idea. Ideas created now control the world we live in. Everything you see around you, what you are holding in your hand, whether it is a pen, was an idea. Whether it is a piece of paper, was an idea. Whether it is the latest technology, if you're saying this Apple, if you're not a Samsung, uh, whatever it is, it was an idea. And the idea gives credence and gives us the ability to control the world we live in. It is a fact, and Trevor and I talk about this all the time, it is a fact uh, that the latest of the technology that we have, uh, the more easier it is for you to be tracked. Yesterday, my brother was uh, on the bus on his way back home from his trip, and, and they said, he sent us a message that the bus broke down. Now, the bus had broke down on the first day they left. And so now the bus broke down on the last day as they're coming back home. He done got the Alpha and the Omega. You know? And so the bus done broke down. And so I, I was asking him where he was. And Vasquez said to me, she said, no, 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 no. Go into the app, find my iPhone. And as soon as I went into the app, it had mine listed. It had his iPad, where it was, and where my iPad was. And it had where his phone was, the direct coordinates of where he was exactly. And all we have to do is pinpoint directly to where he is, and we can go get him. Everything today has changed, and everything has been birthed by ideas. Now, let's take this a step further, okay? When an idea is conceived, when an idea is conceived, it is called a thought. When an idea is conceived, it is called a thought. When a thought is conceived, it is called a concept. I'm going to say it again. When an idea is conceived, it is called a thought. But when a thought is conceived, it is called a concept. And one of the major things you will find, especially I'm primarily my, my background and my undergrad was business administration, and, 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 and it deals primarily with how you take ideas and translate them into concepts and translate them into uh, material objects. And, and, and when we understand how concepts develop, concepts are the material that dreams are made of. Concepts are the material that dreams are made of. I was doing some reading the other day about Walt Disney. <coughs> Walt Disney. And I'm sure everybody in here from the children know Mickey Mouse. But Mickey Mouse was not his original idea. There was another a design, another animal that he had designed before Mickey Mouse, uh, and a friend of his and him had gotten into some sort of disagreement. And as a result, it resulted in him designing another character, which just so happened ended up being stronger than what he had designed in the first place. But concepts are the material that dreams are made of. And they serve as the substance for living and interpreting life. I'm going somewhere. Everything humans have made or invented was first preceded by an idea. In a couple of weeks, I'm gonna show you uh, just how this works uh, when we look at the creation mandate, Genesis 128. So as a matter of fact, inventions are oftentimes called someone's brain child. The mind can be impregnated by ideas that develop into concepts that become visions that produce reality. The mind can be impregnated by ideas that develop into concepts that become visions that produce reality. So concepts are to life. Now I want to really break this down so you understand this. Concepts are to life what blood is to the body. Concepts are to life what blood is to the body. That's why Solomon says in Proverbs, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. You know, we, we love, here I go, we love the cross. And we talk about the cross. We talk about what the cross has done for us. But one of the major things you must understand is that Jesus 
institutes and teaches them about the kingdom of God, which means they have to change their mindset. When he meets Nicodemus, and Nicodemus comes to him at night, and he looks at Nicodemus and he says to him, you must be born again. Oftentimes we see that word be born again. It's really a mistranslation because in the original it says you must be born above. It means you have to change your perspective. You can be in church and you can come and you can gather, you can celebrate and we can have Easter, we can have all kinds of stuff and, and still not be transformed in your mind, in your perspective. And if your perspective is not changed, you will always see things in the prism of your reality. That is why Psalm says, as a man thinketh, so is he. We can only understand life according to the degree that our concepts are correct. We can only understand life according to the degree that our concepts are correct. Let's move. The purpose of communication, and this is where media gets right, and the church sometimes misses out. The purpose of communication is to transfer your ideas and concepts from your mind to another. The purpose of communication is to transfer your ideas and concepts from your mind to another. And then, uh, and Philippians says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, he is introducing the kingdom concept. You to follow me. The kingdom of God is that spiritual realm where the will of God is understood and observed. The kingdom of God is the spiritual realm where the will of God is understood and observed. How do we enter it? We enter the kingdom by spiritual birth. By spiritual birth. When a soul is born into the kingdom and a person becomes a son of God, the new life can have influence when it is directed by the Spirit of God. Which means that all of us as believers, all of us who profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, must always be seeking others to seek the kingdom. Jesus says, seek Ye first the kingdom of God. And if you even look uh, uh, in the verses prior to it, notice what he says. He says, uh, 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 therefore I said unto you, do not worry, verse 25, about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor what your body will put on. Not, is not life more than what food in the body and clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they do not sow nor reap nor gather into bonds. Get your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Uh, uh, notice he says, therefore do not worry, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For these things the Gentiles seek, but your Father already knows what you need. And since your Father already knows what you need, he gives them an instruction, seek him. He said, not the things around you, not the stuff that's going on. He said, if you seek him, he already knows what you stand in need of. And we reverse the concepts and we seek them instead of seeking him. So the first thing we must understand, number one, uh, we must seek in person. We must seek in person. We must seek in person. Let's really get down to the rudiments of this verse. He says, but seek ye first. Seek ye. Seek ye first. It's old English, but seek ye. Uh, he's really saying this is a personal matter. This is a personal matter. This is a personal matter. The individual must be born into the kingdom. And then the kingdom of God will, when they receive, when they come into the kingdom of God, then they will begin to be birthed into what Christ desires. Uh, the Great Commission, and I'm really going to build some on this stuff because this is very important. The Great Commission, go ye into all the world, Matthew 28. Uh, make disciples of all nations. We get that confused because we oftentimes think that that means go and make converts. Jesus didn't say make converts, he said make disciples. And the reason why is because a disciple is a learner. A disciple is a pupil. A disciple is an apprentice. Uh, one of the major things that we often have heard uh, when Jesus says in, in the Gospels, uh, when you walk out and they don't receive you, wipe the dust off your feet. And um, um, sometimes when we read that, 
we can almost get confused because what they did in, in early uh, Palestine times, especially in the first century, uh, whenever uh, the disciples walked behind their rabbi, their teacher, they were literally called, they called the term being in the dust of the rabbi. So whenever they walked, they walked behind them and their dust traveled behind them, traveled beneath them. So when he says that you ought to walk, uh, and if they don't receive you, uh, allow the sandal to go off your feet. What he's really allowing them to understand is that if they don't receive the instruction, then you continue to follow the dust of your leader. It was an entirely different thought process. It was an entirely different perspective. Okay? Uh, uh, and, and see, the Spirit will lead and direct us in seeking others when our souls yield to him. And this is challenging today because we, we only want one part of the gospel. Uh, uh, Jesus, and I, I said this on Friday night when I was preaching somewhere, and this is very important, uh, because the gospel is not just invitation. It is also challenge. And just as much as Christ will invite you, he will also challenge you. You have to yield to him and allow him to have his way in thought, word, and action. So, uh, uh, well, I, I came this, I and mean, then I did this, and I did that. But, but if you have not yielded to him, and he does not have his way in your thoughts, your words, and your actions, what does it look like to be a follower? And see, uh, we, 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 we get this, this, we get this uh, messed up because we see people who are gifted and, and all of that. But the fruit is what Christ looks at. And your fruit determines the capacity of what you receive. We have to yield in thought, word, and action. So how do we seek? We must seek earnestly. We must seek anxiously. And we must seek continually. We must seek earnestly, anxiously, and continually. Number two, we must seek with priority. Everybody say prioritize. He says, seek ye, not only seek ye, but seek ye first. So we are to put the kingdom first, even before we see other things around us. Even before we look at food and clothes and drinks and everything else. He said, the kingdom and its interest must be first in thought, in expression, in prayer, and in effect. It must be first in time, rank, and importance. It must dominate the entire being. Seek the kingdom before worldly pleasure, before wealth, before popularity. And oh my goodness, mm -hmm. today uh, we are consumed, especially in the church, with popularity. But he says, I want you to seek me. Because if you seek me, I will guide and put everything together in your view. Uh, we have to seek not only uh, with priority, but number three, we must seek with purpose. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we are to seek with purpose. We are to seek with purpose. We are to seek with purpose. When the kingdom is in the heart and its interests become first in your life, the person will begin to be found in right relationship with God. Uh, when we understand our purpose, it gives us clarity about where we are called and where God has desired and destined us to go. The supreme purpose in seeking the kingdom is that righteousness might rule the lives of all in relationships at all times. So we're not just to seek it in purpose, but we are also finally to seek it with profit. Notice he says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. The things shall be added after you understand the formula. These things, what do these things deal with? These things, necessary food, clothing, drink, the promises of Jesus is definite and positive. It shall be added. 
the motive of personal gain should never prompt us to just seek God for what we can get from him. And that's the challenge today. Because we live in a culture, we live in a world, we live in a society uh, uh, in which everything is what's in it for me. So if I'm going to serve God, what's God going to do for me? If I'm going to be a follower, what's God going to do for me? If I'm going to worship, what's God going to do for me? Everything we do, everything we have, everywhere we go, everything that we turn around and see, it all revolves around the self. And when you live in a culture and a world that revolves only around the self, you will never be able to maximize your full potential in Christ. The greatest gains in this life are spiritual. The greatest gains in this life are spiritual. So he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. When he says this, it doesn't make sense at first. Because he's requiring people to transform where they are and then conform to his desires. It is both an invitation and it is also a challenge. As I close, I think about this morning, all the lives that have been shed in the last two weeks, especially outside of our nation and as we watch on screens and some things we have heard and some things we have not heard of all of the people that have been martyred and killed uh, for their belief in Jesus. And I think about uh, how we live in America and it is so convenient and we've gotten so complacent because we are adjusted to our lifestyle and our things. And we have created a theology and an idea based upon things. And that's why when things fall apart, and when things in our life get out of whack, and when things in our lives turn out ways we have never anticipated or expected, we're ready to throw God out and throw everything else out because our foundation was sought by things. But when you understand what Jesus says in this passage, and he says to seek my kingdom first, he's talking about a lifestyle change. He's talking about a paradigm change. And we have gotten so accustomed in the church to doing church antics and church things. And we have fully missed what Jesus was saying. He says, as you understand who I am, as you fully follow what I have given you, as you fully walk in what I have promised you, then you will see my hand in every area, in every facet of your life.